Thank you, Dr. Barlin. Uh, that was quite funny. I hope I can have your humor for the rest of this afternoon. It might lighten us up a little bit. Um, all right, so the next round of speakers will be covering topics related to gifted education for Indigenous students. Uh, we're going to switch up the order a little bit, and uh, I'm going to welcome Dr. Michael Little Crow, who is an Indigenous math educator from the Turtle Mountain Anish Anave Cree. Yay, uh, people. He co founded the nonprofit organization Open Global Village, Original People's Education Network, which supports two education abroad projects to Thailand and one sabbatical teaching mathematics through robotics in Kazakhstan. He works, with the, he works with the education agencies of several tribal nations to provide professional development in mathematics and workshops which use the 3,000-year-old mental calculation techniques from India to empower learners of all ages. Dr. Lidicro is currently serving as a teaching assistant professor at Arizona State University, as well as an adjunct faculty at Scottsdale Community College. Today, Dr. Lidicro will present revealing the gifts within instructional practices to develop talent of Indigenous students. Let us please welcome Dr. Michael Lidicro. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Michael Little Crow from Arizona State University, um, and we have a, a special gift that uh, the time I was asked to do this, uh, my teacher and wife was in Thailand at the time, so I didn't know if she would be. Oh, oh, okay, uh, we'll try this again. So I'd like to uh, say hello to everyone. It's been a great pleasure being here. Uh, as I was mentioning initially, is uh, when I was asked to do this, I, I knew I was here. My wife was doing some work in Thailand, taking care of her family, uh, partly because of the COVID uh, situation, but also she was uh, doing some work in the education field. And she was actually uh, selected as a person of the year for her work in psychology and education. And so she, um, yes, thank you. And so from my indigenous perspective is when I have learned something, it is better for me to bring the teacher who taught it than to try to teach it myself again. So she's going to, uh, this presentation's interactive. Uh, it's going to be showing you how to draw the giftedness from within yourself, because that's what I think of indigenous is, is to be able to look inside yourself. And we're, I, I was very uh, happy to hear Dr. Ann saying that all people, all students, are gifted, and that's what we really believe. So this uh, this comes from about a two hour to a six hour workshop that we've done together. Uh, so we're going to get it done in thirty minutes. So you're going to get a flavor for how it works um, and how we can draw the giftedness from within the students. Um, we'll just move forward. Okay. So first of all, I, I uh, it's been a pleasure being part of uh, the Beam Advisory uh, Board for the last several years, and. Uh, I like that word so much, be a mathematician, but in this setting, we're going to slightly change the name a little bit, the be present, lead by example for the teachers, apply adragogy, which is adult education, and realizing your students, even when they're children, they come to you with knowledge already. Uh, pedagogy sort of assumes that they're a blank slate. Adragogy accepts that everyone comes to us with some knowledge. And then finally, practice mindfulness. So there's our, our new beam uh, that we'll be using today. So what is mindfulness uh, from this practice that we look at? And the way I've been taught is to think of it as just keeping something in mind. And of course, what we'll see in, in mathematics, I'm using some techniques from ancient India where the mathematics was relational. And so you keep those relationships in mind as you do the mathematics. But it's so much more helpful if you have the technique of getting into the state of being mindful uh, that Dr. Pintong will share with us. So here's where this comes from is that uh, uh, an article I read a long time ago on stress, uh, the reaction to, that students have spe specifically with math uh, and helping to find that teacher within. So when, when students take in a math word problem, 
typically where it goes. The part of the brain that gets real active is the amygdala. That's the fight or flight or the emotional memory part, not the mathematical processing part. Uh, and it's uh, here's a reference to the article. Uh, so it comes in, it goes there, it, it amplifies the stress. And then it's something like even a frowning face, like maybe the teacher's not so happy with what's going on, will increase the stress and reduce the student's uh, ability to answer accurately. When engaged in mathematical problem solving, highly math anxious individuals suffer from intrusive thoughts and ruminations. Um, and this takes up their processing and working memory. It's as much as though individuals with math anxiety use up the brain power they need for the problem on worrying. So they're, they're stuck on this worrying. Uh, and I put myself in that stage. I, I'm actually, I'm not a math teacher because I was so great at math. I'm a math teacher because I struggled with math and I found my way through. And so that's the work I do with students. Uh, here's the good news, though. Um, is that this stress reaction that these students are having, the ones that it hits the hardest, they may be the ones that are actually the most enthusiastic about math because they really care about what they're trying. They're trying to learn. They're wanting to do it. They're more stressed, and then they don't get it to the right part of the brain that could handle it. Okay, so this is the thing of finding that giftedness. There, there are gifted students, but they're hiding because they don't see their gift. They don't know how to apply it. So we got looking, uh, thanks to Dr. Pintog, at some of the brain functions, so right brain function. One of the things we noticed, uh, the emotional memory is down here where things go. But if we use our fingers, and many of us, especially indigenous peoples, we use our fingers in math. And if you do that, look what's right next to the part of the brain that controls the fingers, the mental math part of the brain. Um, and on the left side, a similar type thing, we've got to get it away from our emotional memory, right? If we use our fingers, it brings it up into the math processing part. So here's another technique. So we'll be using our, our hands to do a few things along with some mindfulness practice. So also when I teach math, I've, I, I've looked through math history. And where I've come up is the, the at least the modern mathematics, the center of modern mathematics is, is India. The numbers we write, they came from the mathematical school in northern India. Southeast Asia, uh, the number systems that they use are similar, but they're different symbols, and they come from a southern school in India. But India was the center of mathematical thought three to 5,000 years ago, and all of our mathematical thought has really come from that place. Um, and Dr. Pentong has actually gone to India, uh, spent several months there uh, practicing mindfulness and meditation. And so there's this part of it that uh, mathematics was not just a separate field, but it was it was part of all sciences. Everything was integrated. So one of the things she's taught me to bring into my classrooms is a is just a two minute mindful breathing activity that I shared with my students. Uh, she simply direct your thought. So I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. So we walk through a guided meditation where students are just watching their breath. Sometimes students feel a little strange. It's meditation stuff. I said, well, you don't have to participate. Just hold your breath for two minutes and we'll get back to you. So most of them will participate. I said, you're going to breathe, right? Uh, then there's the evaluation part. And this is the part that we mostly, because we all breathe, but we forget to evaluate, is that breath the best it could be? Is it making me more relaxed or is it making me tense? So that's the evaluation start part. And then when we get it, the evaluation part right, and we get our breath in a place where we're um, being relaxed, then it's pleasurable and we want to do it more and we're in a good spot. So I've done this in my math classes uh, at the community college. It's a little harder at the university where I've got 150 students in one class, but that's why I really look at myself as a community college professor because I, I like working with groups of about 24. It's much nicer to do these kind of exercises. Um, I'm going to share this with you. This was a, a workshop that uh, Dr. Pintong and I did. She did the mindfulness part, got them mindful. I used some of the techniques from ancient India that are really mindful math. And this student of mine, uh, who had been struggling a lot, uh, he gave us a little bit of a... Um... Yeah, the stuff that I learned today, I, I honestly never knew it. I guess when the meditation, when you use meditation, you relax more. You feel more comfortable when you're doing math. Like, instead of just going to class, like I told you the first time when I actually did the meditation, 
I feel like we should use that in every class before every class. And I ask them to do that because when I'm when I'm I'm overwhelmed when I'm coming to this class regardless, just because like, you know, school, a lot of work. And we don't get the time to actually relax, take in everything, soak in everything, just relax our mind, body, and soul, which is what we do before we go to class. And it helps me to learn it and take in everything that I'm learning, not just like learning and remembering it. Because I have a short time memory, like I just learn it and then I'll be out of class and forget about it. But like when I actually relax, sit there and just be relaxed and actually want to learn after the meditation, like when I first came in, then that's when I actually learn it. And I ask more questions and I engage it more. So it's very helpful, especially to me, because I never knew nothing about like meditation. At all. I didn't even know what it was until I actually took this class. So it was very helpful for me as a student. Thank you guys. Very good. Okay. So and this student was, uh, he had some special struggles that semester. His uh, One of his brothers had passed away and um, he was really struggling. He was one that would remind me, sometimes I would think, oh, I got so much to do today, I'll skip the, the two minutes of mindfulness. And he would say, Mr. Little Crow, can we, can we breathe? And I said, oh yeah, we, let's start with the breathing. So we do it two minutes and we'd actually get more done that way. So I, uh, part of it was, uh, what sort of surprised me, I don't know why it did, but, but the uh, training that I went through for mindfulness, I had forgotten how it would make me mindful. You know, I was just focused on how it would make the students mindful. I was forgetting it was making me mindful too. And so I was doing a better teaching job while they were doing a better job of, of focusing whenever we did it and uh, missing it uh, caused uh, some problems. So uh, this is uh, some of Dr. Pintong's work, and I was one of her subjects in this one. She did that. She put together a six-week mindfulness course. It's got mindfulness of breathing, walking, speaking, listening, eating. It's a whole course. Uh, what it did is she, her focus was to reduce stress on teachers, uh, and it really worked. Every teacher who took this six-week course had reduced stress, which was the, the focus of it. And then the goal is also that we bring that into our classes. So the uh, QR code, if you take your camera on that, you'll you'll see a link to that class She's uh, that has it available. It's also got her bio in there. Um, but what, we, what I'd like to do at this time is go ahead and invite Dr. Pintong to come up to lead you uh, through some of the research he's done, but mostly lead you through an experience of mindfulness. And then I'm going to take you through that experience of uh, the ancient Indian math and the related ways of doing it. But you need to be in that mindful state for it to really have its full power. So Dr. Pintong, please come join us. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the, inviting me to this conference. Um, this is uh, the, the link. There's a, the research attempt. If anyone is interested about research reports or methods, welcome to check on the link too. Ah, OK, thanks. So some of you might know about the mindfulness. Some of my been practicing. Who, anyone been practicing? How long? Um, off and on for a few years. OK. OK, you will um, heard my story at the end. Um, I don't have much time because I took time for, from the doctor, Michael. I, I will show a little bit about um, mindfulness that I created in the six weeks class, uh, six weeks, six weeks in Thailand, we in Thailand. And um, let's go ahead, Ruth, okay.
these are science of my school education, my school life. Our workshops are created to help you gain self-understand and joyful as move forward in your education path. Many students have already experienced greater learning success which have led to increased happiness for them and for people around them. Please contact us if you are interested in learning more about our science of mindful education, mindful life, support to build concentrate and greater academic success. Okay, that is um, um, different many methods, different many methods such as uh, sitting, standing, um, uh, lighting down, eating, uh, speaking, and uh, um, yeah, that's a use in my class. So, are you ready for have some experience of mindful? Actually. People might know about meditation, right? Some of you, a lot of you know. But it's kind of different. Mindfulness, but they have to go together. So now we're going to practice mindful meditations, just two minutes. Um, if you are, make yourself comfortable. And... If you don't like to close your eye, you just look down. Okay? So please, closing your eyes, relax, relax your jaw, your shoulders, your arms, feel your body, touch the chair, your feet, Touch the floor, calm your mind, set any worry behind, just be a present the moment, and then take a few deep breaths through your nose. Feel your stomach with in breath, and then let any stress empty without the out breath. Do it a couple times. Then let the breath naturally come in and out. Don't let your mind follow when your breath gone out. 
try to keep at the front knob not strong area. Feel any sensations of your breath in and out. Observe it. It's hot or cold, short or long. As your breath come in, feel it all the way to the abdomen. As it's gone out, feel it's arrived to the chest, to the nose, to the throat, to the nose. If you hear the sound or smell something, just note it, non judgment. It's just the sound and the sin. The more you pay attention on your breath in and out, the more you will see quiet mind. If your mind wonder, what is this in the mind? Then let go. Gently, Bring it back your attention to your breath in and out. Keep continue practicing like this. I will cut quiet about one minute. Okay, we, before you open your eyes, give yourself love and kindness to yourself and under, and slowly to open your eyes. How you feel? It's, some of you might feel like really, you know, it's kind of not comfortable with this one. I mean, like... You, ha, have you even been practicing about this before? It's my, if you do practicing like this regularly, you will be comfortable. Sometimes, like when you first start, you may feel uncomfortable with your in breath, and I bet some might increase your anger or your dislike thing inside. But the more you practice, the more you will find your way. So this is the research finding from a Dr. Davidson. There's a, a actual data methods practice can lead to long-lasting change in the brain, which is means um, it also can improve learn, student learnings and reduce uh, stress and anxiety. That's our Tibet monk. I've been to India. Um, when I took, when I back to Thailand and I went to India for seven days and also I met a Tibet monk and we talk about the meditation how we difference on he uh, he he perspective and my perspective but kind of fun so I will turn this back to Dr. Lirico and oh do I have time I want to share this story one of uh, my participants she um, uh, she told me she have a been a practice meditation about 30 years. I said, wow, that's, you might be expert. And she stopped to doing it one and a half year. From that, she kind of leaned her to darkness side. 
she lost her husband, created her depressed, and she created her loneliness, and she frustrated, and she is a teacher. So I said, well, would you come join my, um, my research? And she said, yeah. So after six weeks, she find her way back to practice mindfulness and meditation. And she, even she courage in herself, hey, I have to do this. I have to do this regularly. That's why it brings me joy and happiness. So this is which means it doesn't matter you how long you've been meditating. If you just stop, it, it, it means it stops. That's why whatever, whatever happened in your life, just practice mindfulness. It will help you. So you can bring this to your classroom and encourage your student. Just one minute, two minutes. You know, help them bring the gift from them side, from, from inside that they can help themselves and also they can help others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pentong. And now that you have the state of mindfulness that you're in, I'd like to share with you, and especially if you've struggled with math in the past, I think you might find uh, this very interesting. Most times I, I present it to my students, they've never seen this before, um, and they wish they would have learned it when they were kids, and I feel the same way. So first of all, uh, in the Vedic system of mathematics, five to three to five to maybe more than that, that as far as what's written thousands of years ago, uh, they looked at numbers in circles. And so they used 16 sutras in the, in the Vedas, these ancient texts. And the first one was by one more than before. And that's really how numbers get built. So we start with something, which is one, and by one more than before, we start <clears throat> to build the counting system. And so we're going to go a circle. We put these numbers in a, in a circle rather than on a number line. And this is the way we can start to spot some rel uh, relationality between the numbers. Now, there's a lot of different patterns. And in my classroom, I'll have them look at that for a period of time. But today, I want to kind of guide you into seeing if you look on 10 and each side of 10, what do you start to see? Nine and one, eight and two is 10, seven and three six and four, and then five and five. Five is its own complement. We call these complements. So it's dealing with math as uh, completing things. And if we look at our hands, if we put two fingers down, we've got eight up. That's a complement of 10. We put three down, we've got seven up. So there's our complements built into our physical bodies as well. And we're going to build with that. The other circle that they looked at is that that becomes important in Vedic math is a circle of nine. And what I like to do with this one is as we build the number system, we put one someplace and then we go the other direction. So this, the nice thing about Vedic math is you can do it forward, backwards, left, right. It's not dependent upon that. It's so you can do it in the way that works best for you. Uh, and again, we looked at the nine in this case, and in each side of the nine, we get the complements to nine, eight and one, seven and two, six and three, five and four. And then nine's also got a complement. It's nine and zero is, is also nine. So what we do is we work with mindfulness to build these relationships so we just see them. Because that's the brain, or the human brain works pretty well. Rather than memorizing things, we see these things as connected. Eight is connected with one as a complement to nine. If it's a complement to ten, eight and two are connected. So it, it does kind of change over it. But let me show you how uh, we can use this to teach um, how to, like, maybe give change. So let's see, which one am I going to do? I'm going to do A here. So the complement of eight to nine. So what we're doing here is all from nine to last to ten. So all, we're starting from the left and going to the right. Uh, I'm dyslexic, so I have difficulty with my left and right sometimes. So please forgive me on that. But the complement of eight, eight and one make nine. And then the last one is a complement to 10. So seven and three. And when you put those together, you see that you get a, what we call a base number. So it's like if I had a hundred dollar bill and I wanted to make bought something for $87, 13 would be the change. So you can use this system all from nine to last from 10. I think we're gonna jump over to C. Complement of nine is zero, zero is nine, and then the last complement is three to seven, is, and that gives us a, a complete base of 1,000. And I, again, this is a, we spend 
many times down here we can do it and you're just looking at complements complement three six four seven and then two is the last non-zero number so two goes with eight that's a complement to ten uh, zero is its own complement and then we get to a base number we start with this and it's and then we can move on into subtraction and we teach a few little additional techniques on it but we do subtraction not as takeaway but as complements and it's it's using a different part of the brain um, in a different way in a mindful way uh, along with that uh, oftentimes younger students especially have problems learning their multiplication tables I did and you're just told to memorize 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 but let's see how uh, this system as long as we know up to five times five we don't have to memorize anything else everything else is there so we're with two hands, what we're going to do is the complement of eight is two, so two fingers go down. The complement of seven is three, so three fingers go down. And then what we do with these is, so there's our complements. The up fingers, we count at each as ten. Let's see if I got the, I got to keep one. Uh, so there's five fingers up, so that's 50. And then what I always do is, is knock your down fingers together. That's multiplication. You're going to take your down fingers and multiply them. Two times three is six. So we've got 56. And that's what seven times eight is. And I always, and my personal thing is when I was a kid, I was cheap. So I made my own uh, flashcards and I, I made a mistake when I did seven times, eight times seven, I mixed it up with nine times six. So I memorized those facts backwards, but I did a real good job of memorizing that sometimes today I even forget which one is which, but now I can use my fingers to figure, oh wait, this one is the one with the six. And, um, and so what I do is I, again, We'll uh, keep moving forward, but I, I just have the students go through and I have them draw pictures of their fingers. And I, and I said, this is why I'm not an art teacher, because, but it, you can see the, here's our hands. Uh, we draw them, we do them. And again, it just reemphasizes that using complements and this addition and, and multiplication that we can get that. There's a, a slightly different method to use to go from 11 to 15. So that even gives them either greater power because a lot of people memorize up to 10 times 10, but who's, you know, most of us stopped. Uh, but here, if you teach that additional similar method, um, they can be doing up to 14 times 15, you know, under the table. And, and that makes them feel real good. Uh, made me feel good. Uh, this is also used in multiplication. Uh, there's a sutra called vertically and crosswise. So we, we build with the hand sort of things. This is really what we just did. So nine times eight, we look at the complements, the complement of a, nine is one and the complement of eight is two and i've got negatives because we're going to subtract them so this is the same thing we would do with our hands but what they would do on paper this way uh, is vertically they'd multiply one times two and they get two and then they would do a cross subtraction either nine minus two which is seven or eight minus one which is also seven that's 72 so this is a way of doing multiplication similar to what we were just doing with our hands and i'll show a couple eight Here's our, our eight and seven, it's two and three, we get the six and we get the five. But what's cool about this system is our hands only have so many fingers, but we can do this up into the teens. So 11 is one above, 12 is two above, vertically we multiply them, that's two. Crosswise now, since we're, we've got what's called a surplus over 10, we add. So 12 plus 1 or 11 plus 2 gives us 13. It's 132. So now we're getting even greater math power. But we could go to the hundreds. As, again, as long as you're close to that base number. Uh, and again, I'm just picking out a few. So 92, the, the complement would be 8. That would make 100. 99, the complement is 1. That would be 100. 1 times 8 is 8. Actually, we put 0, 08 because we need two decimals. And again, it's one of the things they pick up. And then we're going to cross subtract. I would do 92 minus 1. You could do 99 minus 8. Whichever one you want to do, whichever's easier, you would see that that answer is 9108. And again, I, I break out the calculators because they don't know it. And then once they start doing it, they say this works. And it gives them a way that, and again, it's, it's teaching them to do it mentally. Um, and it makes them feel good. It made me feel good. In fact, actually, I was going to teach, a, a, I was asked to talk to a fourth grade class, and I wasn't sure I would be real sharp because I'm, I'm not sharp with my mathematics. I learned these techniques so that I would look good in the, in the eyes of these fourth graders, and it worked.
it worked. So, um, and again, even even a number that's kind of far away, like 77, you get good at, at getting the compliments. And then it's just 23 times two, which is really, you're just doubling it. And then you're able to get this number really good. And, and you're able to just kind of pull this out mentally. And then people think you're smart, whether you are or not. But so you start finding gifts. And then when you believe you're smart, that's where the gifts really start to flourish. Uh, and we'll just go through a few more, but it's just, it gets there. Um, so I had something really profound to say, but I completely forgot what that is. But uh, I just thank you all for inviting both of us here. Uh, we really enjoy putting on workshops like this, working with students and seeing them. Uh, the only problem I had is after I brought uh, Dr. Pintong to that workshop, my students were saying, when are you going to bring her back? We're kind of, you know, because daily class, I says, well, it's, you know, during class, you got me. Sorry. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you so much. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it.